You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Phillips Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, I'm Mike McDaniel. I'm the preacher for the Central Church of Christ in Carothersville, Missouri. And you're watching a Bible answer. This program is dedicated to answering the Bible questions from our viewers. We're glad you're watching today. Please tell other people about this program and where it may be seen in your area. We have three gospel preachers with us to serve as our panelists to answer your questions. We'll have them introduce themselves to you at this time. My name is Andy Brewer. I preach for the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee. My name is Charles Taylor. I preach for the Front Street Church of Christ in Milan, Tennessee. My name is Terrence Manis. I preach for the Troy Road Church of Christ in O'Brien, Tennessee. We are delighted to have these good brethren with us today. And we're also thrilled to have these good questions that our viewers have sent in. Our first question goes to Brother Andy Brewer. The person says, When the Bible says the body returns to dust and the spirit returns to the Lord, what happens to the soul? Brother Brewer. That's a great question. I think it's one that a lot of people probably have as well just because of the, the usage of the words. But simply put, the, the word soul as used in most contexts throughout the scriptures simply means one and the same as the word spirit. They both just simply have a reference to the eternal part of man that is not susceptible to death but continues to live on once this life is over. And to demonstrate that, let's look at a couple of verses that refer to each word and speak of them as being that eternal part of man. For instance, in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen had been stoned and was just about to die, you remember that these words were the ones he uttered with his last breath. He looked upward and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Well, in Acts 7, 59, Stephen is obviously there referring to his spirit as that part of his eternal being, that part of him that would go on to live once this life is over. Well, similarly, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he quoted from David, uh, from Psalm 16 and verse 10 in his sermon, this is what he said in verse 27, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in Hades, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Well, David in Psalm 16 and Peter in quoting him were both referring to the soul again as that eternal part of man, that part of our being that is not susceptible to death but continues to live on once this life is over. So in, in common context, the two words are synonymous and throughout Scripture they are typically used interchangeably. So when the Bible says the body returns to dust and the spirit returns to the Lord who gave it, uh, what happens to the soul? Well, if the spirit went on to be with the Lord, that's where the soul goes as well because the spirit and the soul in that sense are the same. Uh, thank you for that good question. I hope that answer helped in some way. Thank you. Our next question is for Brother Taylor. Is it true that God doesn't pay attention to anyone's prayers until they have received the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38? We'll give that to you, Brother Taylor. I appreciate that question. Uh, I want to begin by pointing out that uh, in Acts 2 and verse 38 is not a section of Scripture dealing uh, with prayer, basically dealing with uh, the plan of salvation being taught. Uh, but there are a number of passages in the Scriptures that teaches about prayer so that one can gain a good understanding. Uh, we understand that God welcomes the prayers of those that are His spiritual children. I want to mention some passages. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, the Bible says, Pray without ceasing. Christians are invited to go to God in prayer. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 16, it says, Be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. 
And so again, we find that Christians are invited to come to God in prayer uh, because they are his spiritual children. James 5 and verse 16, the Bible says, confess your faults one to another, pray one for another. The fix your fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Then we find in 1 Peter 3 in verse 12, it says, the eyes of the Lord is over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. So we find that the Bible shows that Christians, children of God, are invited to go to God in prayer. There are some passages that shed some light on the kind of prayers uh, that God will not hear. Proverbs 28 and verse number 9, it points out that he that turneth away his ears from hearing the law, his prayer is an abomination uh, to God. Proverbs 15 and verse number 29, it says, The Lord is far from the wicked but he heareth the prayers of the righteous. And so we find that those that are in a right relationship with God, uh, those that are, are Christians that have been saved, uh, then God welcomes their prayers and we find that he uh, will respond to those prayers. Uh, the Bible teaches that we, prayers are answered in various ways. In Acts chapter 12, verse five, we find that uh, the church was praying for Peter. And while they were still in their prayer session, uh, God freed Peter uh, from prison. So he, there was a yes to that prayer. Then sometime there's a no. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses seven through nine, Paul pointed out that he had prayed to God uh, regarding a thorn in the flesh. And he let him know that I will not remove the thorn in the flesh. I'll give you the strength to fulfill your ministry, but I, I'm saying no to that request. And we can find passages in the Bible where people had been praying and they had to wait. God was not saying no, but they, they finally got the answer they were looking for. Luke chapter two is one of those instances where Simeon, according to Luke 2 and 25 through 32, had been, uh, been praying and God had promised he would see the Savior that had been promised. And he did see Jesus when he was brought in as a child. Uh, and so sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer may be no. And, and then the answer to prayer may be wait. But it is a privilege that's given to God's children. The Bible teaches that the content of a man's heart, whether he is heard or not, and this is one who was a child of God under the Old Testament, that was David. In Psalm 66 and verse 18, it says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So we understand then that God knows the content of a person's heart when they are praying. In fact, the Bible shows that God knows when a person is hypocritical in their prayers. Uh, Matthew 6 and verse 5, it says, Hypocrites pray to be seen. So God knows when a person's praying, but it does not mean that he welcomes that kind of prayer. We also know God knows when someone is praying from Acts chapter 10. Cornelius was praying in those first uh, five or six verses there. And uh, he let him know that prayers come up as a memorial. He said, but he says, I don't know what he was praying for, but he said, send for someone. And so he sent for Peter. Peter showed him what he needed to do in order to become a Christian. Uh, Acts 9, where Saul or Paul uh, was praying after he had seen the vision, the Bible says he told Ananias before he went to him, he said, he is praying. And Paul had not yet become a Christian. He knew he was praying, uh, but he uh, was not a Christian yet. Uh, so I don't know what Paul was praying, but someone came to tell him what he needed to do so he could become righteous by obeying the gospel. Appreciate that good question. Thank you for that good answer. To Brother Manus, this question in Matthew 7, 22 and 23, how could Jesus not know people even though they claim to have done many wonderful works? Brother Manus. This is a discourse concerning the Sermon on the Mount as the Lord deals with Matthew chapter 7 and verse 22 to 23. Not everyone that said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many were saying to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? In thy name cast out devils, in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you has the sense of approving uh, to the person in question. He is not saying that he does not recognize them, but he did not know them as his own. To work iniquity is to participate in lawless uh, activities as so to live in such a way that one 
does not uh, believe nor understand that he is accountable to God or amenable to God. First John three and verse number four teaches us that whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For well, sin is a transgression of the law. Throughout the New Testament, the final and ultimate and uh, exclusive authoritative uh, words that are spoken by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as he give uh, commands to the apostles that whatsoever I have commanded you, Matthew chapter 23, chapter 28 rather, uh, and verse 20, he declared that the words that he was spoken is going to judge people or men or mankind at the last day, John 12 and verse number 48. When you consider that uh, whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ have not God, 2 John uh, 9. The apostles were warned that men ought to learn not to go beyond the things that are written, uh, 1 Corinthians 4 and verse number 6. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, Colossians 3 and verse 16. Jesus said that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, Matthew 24 and verse number 35. When we consider the phrase, uh, I never knew you, uh, it, is, it suggests I have never been in approving a connection with you. When we consider that the Lord, he knows those that are his, those that are striving to labor and do those things that he has commanded and authorized according to his word. When we look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 19, the Bible says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, and having this seal, the Lord knoweth those that are his. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ, the Bible says, depart from iniquity. We must make sure the works that we do are that which the Lord has commanded and authorized according to the scriptures. Not just something that man has dreamed up or has um, concocted in his own heart, thinking that God will accept in and everything. One's life must be an example with the teachings or the sayings of Jesus. According to Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 25, as Jesus began to conclude uh, the great sermon on the mount, he said, therefore, whosoever heareth these things of mine and doeth them, he says, I, I liken him unto a wise man that built his house upon a rock. And the rains is sin and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. We need to make certain that we are paying close attention to the things that Jesus has taught in his word and examine our life and examine the things that we believe as well as our actions and make sure that we are not being deceived or being misled or misguided, but follow those things that are revealed in the scriptures. Jesus said in John 10 and verse 27, that my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. We need to make sure that we're following the Lord's commandments and doing those things, whatever he has commanded us to do, to make sure he will say, uh, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou has been faithful of a few things. I make thee rule of many. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. We thank you for the question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today, and we want to offer to you a free tract. And our tract today is entitled, what should I teach my child about baptism? If you'd like to have this track, or if you'd like to receive our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course on the Church of the Bible, or to send us your question, just contact us. You may do that by writing us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. You may also reach us by going to our webpage at www.abibleanswertv.org. We have a contact page there where you can send us your request or your questions. You can email us at abibleanswertearthlink.net. You may also call our toll-free number with your request, and that's 1-800-436-0463. Back to our questions today. To Brother Brewer, someone has written, I am opposed to abortion because it is a sin, and I have friends or acquaintances who are opposed as well, but they vote for candidates who support abortion should they do this. Brother Brewer. Well, I appreciate from the outset that the question assumes the fact that abortion is a sin. I obviously agree with you in that, and so my answer obviously isn't really going to touch on 
that issue itself, uh, but more so to do with how we address the issue of abortion when it comes to, to voting and politics. Sometimes we have to appreciate that when it comes to considering the virtue of our vote in view of politics, that politics has a lot of moving parts. Uh, in fact, it has a lot more moving parts than I would prefer, and I think it has a lot more moving parts than most people in our country would prefer. And in the midst of all of those moving parts, there are a lot of things that are good and right, and there are a lot of things that are evil and that are wrong. And there are two things we need to keep in mind when it comes to just giving blanketed endorsements or blanketed condemnations of uh, whether it be specific candidates or in particular political parties. Number one, we need to be very careful in declaring the holiness or lack thereof of any political party. Uh, I, I have yet to find a political party that exists that's perfect. I don't know if you have or not. My guess would be that you haven't. But I've never found a political party that is right on every single moral issue. Now, I'm not going to speak as much to, to other matters because I know there are matters that are political that aren't really a matter of, of eternity. Uh, I'm just talking about matters of morality that would pertain to, to, to matters that would, that would deal with our eternal soul. I've never found a political party uh, across the spectrum that's perfect. Um, what I mean by that is there are those in each political party that may hold good positions on matters of morality, and there are people in all parties, as far as I know, that hold poor positions on matters of morality uh, across the board. And I might even add that there's not a political party that exists that even when given the opportunity uh, over the years has outlawed abortion, even when they've had the opportunity to do so. The problem is sometimes that we're placing all of our trust and all of our hope uh, in government to fix all of our moral problems. And uh, so when you're talking about political parties, uh, I don't know of one that's perfect. I don't know one that's got it right across the board and we need to keep that in mind. The second thing I would mention along these lines is not only do we need to be careful in declaring the, the, the holiness or lack, lack thereof of political parties. We need to do the same when it comes to political candidates based solely on their party affiliation. Uh, you know, there are good political candidates in most political parties. I, I'm not, I may not say every because there may be some parties out there I'm not aware of, and I, I don't want to speak too, too far out. But there's good candidates in most political parties, and there's very bad candidates in every political party that exists. Uh, sometimes, well not really sometimes, all the time, it would be better for us and for our country if we would judge the position of candidates on issues more so than their connection to certain political parties altogether. Now with that being said, um, I have a, obviously have a personal issue with casting my vote for anyone who would be a proponent of abortion. Uh, you said in your question that you believe it is a sin. I, I believe biblically that it is. Uh, the Bible says that God hates the shedding of innocent blood, and I don't know of any more innocent blood that could possibly be shed than that of an unborn baby. And so abortion is clearly a sin, and I, would, I, would, I don't believe I would ever be in a position where I could, in, in good conscience, cast a vote for someone who's a proponent of that. But, you know, I think that also should be said with regard to any matter that's a sin. Abortion is a serious matter, don't get me wrong. But there are also other matters that are present in our political process uh, that government has either uh, uh, has, has, uh, allowed through law uh, or that it has regulated in some way that is still biblically sinful. And yet sometimes we're not as apprehensive to cast our, our vote for political candidates that are proponents of other things that are morally sinful. Uh, and so should we vote for candidates who are proponents of abortion? I, absolutely not. I think it should be illegal and it should be 
uh, it, it should be forbidden from the land, uh, but we should keep the same principle in mind when it comes to other matters of morality and other matters of right and wrong as well. I alluded to this a second ago, but I'll, I'll close my answer with this. Our biggest problem is trusting government to outlaw morality, uh, or outlaw immorality, rather. Uh, what we should really be more concerned with, and this, this thought isn't original with me. I can't remember where I read this one time, but I, I read it and I thought that is as spot on as I can possibly imagine. Uh, what the, the person said is we should be concerned, yes, with making abortion illegal, obviously. But you know what we ought to be more concerned with? We ought to be more concerned with making it unimaginable. I don't just want to live in a country where abortion is illegal. I want to live in a country where it, we couldn't even imagine the thought process behind such a terrible and atrocious act. And you know where the responsibility for that resides? That resides on our shoulders as we seek to teach people the gospel and change hearts and lives uh, to where they think uh, abortion is unimaginable and not just look at it as being legal or illegal. So those are my thoughts on the, on the matter uh, with some biblical background behind them. And I hope that as you continue to explore this, this question in your own mind, that this will help in some way. Thank you. Now to Brother Taylor. Do the first and last of Matthew 19.30 through chapter 20 and verse 16 refer to the Jew and the Gentile? If so, who were the laborers that came in the third, sixth, and ninth hours? Brother Taylor. Uh, this particular parable uh, can be looked at uh, in various ways, and many times parable in the Bible, they sometimes are uh, uh, interpreted incorrectly. Uh, usually a parable have one main point to it, and we can often attach some various things to these uh, parables that uh, fit within a uh, realm of truth. Uh, however, in this particular setting, we find that uh, the rich man had came to Jesus, and he was asking what he needed to do to have eternal life. And uh, he said, you have to sell uh, your wealth. We find that he went away sorrowful. Uh, the apostles evidently was somewhat mystified because here's a man that in their mind, uh, an earthly kingdom would do good to have a rich person there. But uh, that was not important to God. And of course, many times men don't understand uh, where God's coming from. But there's a question asked by Peter <clears throat> in verse 27 of Matthew chapter 19 that would uh, I think set the stage for what we find in Matthew 20 when it talks about the parable and those are being brought in at uh, this uh, uh, ninth hour and the twelfth hour and so forth. In Matthew chapter 19 verse 27, then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have therefore? Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the re regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall set upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Everyone that has uh, forsaken a house, uh, brothers, uh, sisters, father, mother, uh, uh, wife, children, land for my sake, he says they receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. And so it's dealing with reward. And when you get into the parable, you'll find that the problem came when he began to pay those individuals who had been laboring. And he started with the very last one that was hired. And uh, some could say, uh, seemed like purposely he did it that way because if he had started paying the ones who started earlier in the day, those that, uh, they would have took their pay and went on and never would have knew what uh, he paid those that started uh, late in the evening and only work an hour or so, we would say. But he wanted them to get the picture that he is a good master. He's a good uh, person to work for. And the goodness of God is what he's driving home in this particular point, not Jew and Gentile. But he wanted them to understand that God rewards according to his wisdom, his purposes, and his ways. And so uh, it's not necessarily talking about, and sometimes people say that means the age that you become a Christian and so forth, and we can attach all that to it. But I believe the main point is the fact that God, he blesses those uh, in the way that he chooses to, a person that we might think would be low rated in the kingdom, the spiritual kingdom, God looks at it differently. In fact, the Bible points out that that which uh, sometimes is, you would say, looked down upon by men, uh, it is highly esteemed uh, in the eyes of God. And so I believe that that's what this uh, parable is teaching 
Uh, and so we see this man uh, who paid those that worked in hours the same as he did the others. That shows him an extremely good man. And God is a good God. He's willing to bring in Gentiles, Jews, uh, rich, poor, it doesn't matter. Uh, the reward is his to give, and he is a good and a merciful and a kind God, even though uh, we might think it's unfair when we've done more than someone else that they get to go to heaven like we do, but God don't think the way we do. Isaiah 55 mentions that. Appreciate that good question. We extend our thanks to Brother Brewer and Brother Taylor and Brother Manis for doing such a good job today answering these questions on a Bible answer. You know, Jesus said, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom for many. Matthew 20 and verse 28. Too many people in the world today must think that the word service, S-E-E-R-V-I-C-E, -E -E, is spelled S-E-R-V-E-U-S. Serve us. You know, it's as if society trains us from a very early age that we should be served. But Jesus wants us to work for Him and to follow His example and to look for opportunities in which we may serve other people. Just two verses prior to Matthew 20 and verse 28, Jesus told His apostles and us that the greatest thing that one can do is to serve someone in some way. Aren't we glad that Jesus has served us and met our needs? Shouldn't we take thought and serve someone else's needs in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you today and on subsequent days in this new year to be on the lookout to help someone who might be in need, to see the need, and then to see to the need. There is so much satisfaction in the service of the Lord. And as Brother Taylor has just pointed out, from the parable in which Jesus taught, there is also great reward. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer today. And remember, for your Bible questions, there is always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.